Yeah. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I'm Kenny and I would like to give a talk uh, that is going to be about a comparison of vector symbolic architectures. Um, I'm a part of the professorship process automatization and we are with the Chemnitz University of Technology Germany. And yeah, for a better overview, my colleague Per Neubert <clears throat> gave a talk uh, in the last summer session of the VSA webinar series uh, about the hyperdimensional computing in robotics and the comparison of VSAs. Um, the talk was mainly about the uh, robotics application, especially the visual blaze recognition task. And at the end, he gave an outlook about our research of the comparison of VSAs. And yeah, today I would like to take a closer look at the last point, the uh, results of our comparison of vector symbolic architectures. And yeah, let's, by the way, um, let's start. Yeah, why a comparison of VSAs? Um, I will explain it uh, on our own experiences. Um, for, for example, yeah, we had the problem to solve, um, maybe the visual place recognition task, and yeah, we found the method of VSAs or HD computing and want to solve the problem with a VSA, but uh, several questions arise. Um, for instance, are there several different VSAs? Do they have different properties? Which one is for my application the best choice? Or how can it be implemented? And especially for newcomers in this, uh, the field is difficult to survey. And that's why it is, uh, it is important to know the answers to these questions. And yeah, that's why we try to systematize the different implementations of VSAs. And yeah, this is part of um, our paper, which is uh, available on archive as in preprint. And we are also planning to submit the paper to a journal um, within the next week. And on archive, there is an updated version. So the already existing version on archive was extended by some practical experiments. Uh, for example, the uh, visual place recognition task. Okay, now let's see what we have done in our comparison. First, um, yeah, we explained the different VSAs and their, property, uh, their operation, uh, operators and their differences and commonalities. And yeah, the outcome of this first point was that uh, certain binding operations uh, can have important ramifications for some applications. And yeah, by the way, I will highlight some important findings and, and outcomes during the talk with uh, such yellow sticky notes. So they can also be seen um, like uh, take home lessons or, or so on. Yeah, and that's by the way. Um, our second point is based on uh, synthetic experiments on the bundling and binding operation. The outcome of this point is that uh, some VSAs show unexpected and significant results. Our third point is um, regarding practical experiments on the language and visual place recognition task. There we figured out that uh, the synthetic results of our second point are mainly transferable to real world applications. And the last point, and there we provide an implementation of all these A's and that can also be used as a MATLAB toolbox. And yeah, the toolbox provides a simple and test environment for all these A's we evaluated in our comparison. Um, this slide can also be seen as an outline for the following talk. Um, and I would like to tell something to each point individually. Okay, let's go to our first point, the different use VSAs. Um, as you can see, we evaluated and compared a couple of VSAs. They are mainly categorized into real, binary, bipolar, or complex vector space. And yeah, we summarized some properties based on these categories um, within yeah, such a table, such a table. Um, yeah, this is just for an overview. More details can be found in our paper, but uh, one thing has to be said, um, since the bundling operator is almost the same for all VSAs, uh, it's just elementwise addition, um, the binding operator differs 
sometimes a lot uh, for several VSAs. And yeah, that's why we created a taxonomy to systematize uh, this specific operation. Um, the result can be seen in the, uh, on, on this slide on the left side, where we can mainly uh, divide the binding operation into multiplicative and additive operation. And the multiplicative operation can also divide it into self-inverse and non-self-inverse binding operation both with approximate and exact invertible bindings. And yeah, why is it important? Well, um, it implies possible ramifications for applications like the, what is the dollar of Mexico example? Um, I think everyone in the audience uh, know this example. Um, yeah, it consists um, mainly out of two uh, representations, uh, for example, one for the country Mexico and one for the United States. And based on the algebra of a vector symbolic architecture, it is possible to uh, calculate the answer to the question, what is the dollar of Mexico? But yeah. And how this is uh, only possible with uh, self inverse bindings. Also, the self inverse property is necessary for solving this task. And even if the unbinding operator for non self inverse uh, VSAs will be used, um, the equation cannot be simplified uh, to the result, um, as you can see in the, uh, in the notes on the slide. And such VSAs uh, with non self inverse binding require other strategies to solve such tasks. And yeah, we think such an insight is also good to know and very interesting, especially for. Uh, newcomer within this field that tries to apply a VSA to a similar problem. And that's why the take home lesson from our first point is that certain binding operations can have important ramifications for some applications. Okay, um, let's go on to our second point, um, our synthetic experiments. Uh, these experiments are mainly divided into three sub experiments. Um, First, to evaluate the bundling capacity um, with the question, how efficiently can the different VSA store or bundle information into one representation? Um, second is based on the approximately invertible bindings uh, with the question, how good is the approximation of the binding inverse? And the third experiment is uh, yeah, a combination of all three operators together. So with binding, um, bundling and unbinding, and the question uh, to this is how many property value or will filter pairs can be bundled and still provide the correct answer to any query by unbinding a row. Um, within this talk, um, I only concentrate on the first and the third experiment. And yeah, if someone is interested on results from the approximately invertible bindings, um, please refer to our paper. Okay. Then let's see the results um, from the first experiment, the bundling capacity. Yeah, to answer the question, how efficiently can the different VSA store or bundle information into run representation, uh, we did an experiment as follows. Um, we, we have, an, for example, an item memory with some elemental rectors. Each rector is randomly chosen and we select a predefined number of vector out of the item memory, for example, k rectors, and bundle them together. And now um, we compute all similarities to our elemental vectors and select the k highest. And this selection should be the same as at the beginning. And based on it, we can compute an accuracy of a perfect retrieval. And yeah. We apply the experiment with um, various numbers of dimensions and number of uh, k rectors or number of bundled rectors. And yeah, for this, uh, it has also been noted that uh, we only consider the number of dimensions and not the storage capacity. Uh, this will be a separate topic and is out of the scope of uh, this presentation and this comparison. Okay. Um, let's see the result of this experiment. Um, it can be seen uh, on, in this plot. Um, it provides an evaluation of the 
minimum required number of dimensions to achieve almost perfect retrievals for all uh, for different values of k or different number of bundled vectors and it can be said that um, the shallow water lines the less dimensions are required to store the corresponding elemental vectors and yeah the better is the capacity of the vsa um, yeah for a better overview here you can see the different uh, vector spaces uh, from binary real and also the complex or sparse binary vectors and yeah as expected the binary vectors needs more dimensions as for example uh, the real valued vectors um, yeah, because uh, the binary vectors has a smaller range of values uh, with only zeros and ones. Interesting is the uh, result of the complex and sparse binary architecture. Um, both uh, yeah, requires uh, only a few dimensions to store the different number of bundled vectors and has a high uh, capacity and especially the second point, the, the complex domain is very interesting because um, complex, a complex phase or complex phase A rectors contain only the angles of the complex numbers as real valued numbers. So uh, this is an assumption of uh, the complex phase A. And so we can conclude that if real numbers are treated as if they were angles of a complex number, then this increases the efficiency of bundling. So this is a um, uh, quite interesting and important uh, outcome from this experiment and that yeah, leads to uh, an, this take home lesson. The summaries A uh, show unexpected and significant results, especially the complex VSA. Okay, and uh, now let's see um, uh, an extension of this experiment, um, expand the bundling by binding and unbinding, so all operators together. Um, to do so, we did an experiment similar to one of the experiments from the book How to Build the Brain from Elias Smith. Um, for this experiment, we also have an item memory with elemental vectors. And from this item memory, we bind vectors to k pairs. And these pairs are bundled together into one representation. And now we try to retrace the elemental vectors from the result by unbinding one of the original vectors. For example, if we want to retrace the vector A1, we have to unbind B1 from our uh, complete bundle. Yeah, uh, for this experiment, we also vary the number of dimensions and the number of bundled pairs. The result can be seen in a similar plot to the capacity experiment. And here, each line represents one binding type of a VSA, and the same goes for here. The shallower the lines, um, the better is the performance of the VSA. And yeah, the many lines can complicate, com can complicate the overview. Um, that's why we evaluate the VSAs by comparing their accuracies to those of the capacity experiment um, as follows. Um, on the left side, we, we have our results from the bundling capacity and select the minimum required number of dimensions to uh, retrieve 15 bundled vectors. And we select from the last experiment the, 15, uh, the minimum required number of dimensions to um, retrieve uh, 15 uh, bundled pairs. And the question is, uh, does the capacity change if bundling is extended by binding or unbinding. Um, it's like a binding and unbinding on the noise and the noise comes from the bundling. Yeah, the results are summarized in the, um, in, in, in the table below. And the second column is regarding the bundling capacity experiment and the third regarding the uh, last uh, experiment. And it can be, also seeing the increase of uh, number of dimensions between um, both experiments. And here, yeah, most of these A's has almost no changes and are within the bounds of plus minus 5%. And this means that the binding and unbinding operator 
is uh, yeah robust against noise. And yeah, as I mentioned uh, at, um, at the beginning, the noise is caused by uh, bundling of the pairs. And yeah, noticeably is uh, that there's a significant rise of number of dimensions for the last sparse binary VSA. And yeah, there the binding of sparse vectors uh, in combination with bundling requires uh, more dimension, as you can see. Um, Up to forty-four percent more percent larger vectors. Okay. Um, these are the results of our synthetic experiments, and now we want to figure out the performances on practical experiments. And then we evaluate the VSAs on um, the language recognition task, as well as on the visual blaze recognition task. And we try to answer the question. Are the insights of the previously seen synthetic experiments uh, transferable to the real applications or the practical applications? Um, now let's try to answer this question based on the language recognition. Um, for this, we did an experiment similar to the reference one. And yeah, the goal of the language recognition is to recognize the language of, an, of a given text. For this, uh, each letter is represented by randomly chosen hypervector, and to construct a meaningful representation of the whole, whole language, um, short sequences of letters are combined in n-grams. And the learning or training of a language is simply done by bundling all n-grams of a training data set. And for recognizing the language of a given query text, uh, the same procedure as for learning is repeated and the nearest neighbor query with all known language vector in the item memory is performed. And for this experiment, we also vary the number of uh, dimensions and the result can be seen uh, on this slide. So we try to figure out the efficiency, so which we aim with only few dimensions to reach high accuracy. And we also, um, for better readability, um, the faster the curves have a high accuracy, uh, the better is the performance and the better is the VSA. And yeah, the result is that the complex and the matrix binding VSA show good results. And yeah, similar to our synthetic experiments, or to the results of our synthetic experiments. And that's why we, we can say, okay, for, for the first practical experiments, um, the results are mainly transferable to real world applications. Um, yeah, it's, it's based on, on the uh, results, for example, from the complex VSA that shows in both very good results. And yeah, let's see um, how it is for our second practical experiment, the visual place recognition task. Um, I do not explain the visual place recognition in detail. Um, for this, I would like to refer to Pear's talk last time. But uh, nevertheless, we, we have to encode our, for example, images into uh, descriptors according to specific VSA rector space. And based on these image descriptors, we apply two different methods. First, the state of the art method um, from sequence slam for visual blast recognition, and the Sequence slam as a VSA implementation. So as a it's it's like an approximation of the original sequence slam with a VSA. Why a VSA is an approximation? Yeah, um, the VSA approach has the advantage of only um, requiring a single vector comparison to decide about a matching, um, while sequence slam typically requires five to ten times as many comparisons. So you can see a VSA can be more efficient than the original sequence line method. And yeah, with the results for both, we, yeah, we compare, compare the results and try to answer the question, yeah, how good performs the VSA approximation compared to the original sequence line method? And our results, um, we, we summarized our results within a table. Um, you can see we evaluate all VSAs on five different data sets. 
each with uh, several database and query images. And yeah, we write down the results um, as follows. For example, we have a VSA. Then we apply for each VSA type or each VSA encoding the original sequence limb method as well as the VSA approximation. And yeah, write down the results column rise. Um, yeah, we did this for each VSA. And yeah, the resulting table is uh, yeah, like this. Um, for better readability, we, we add some colored arrows. Um, green, yellow, and red arrows. Uh, a green arrow means that the VSA approximation is able to um, reach the same, um, the same performance as the original sequence line method. And yeah, red arrow means uh, the VSA is not able to approximate the original sequence line. And yeah, as you can see, for example, the real valued map architecture is able to yeah, reach for all data sets the um, yeah, performance of the original sequence lamp and as well as the metrics binding these A reach also uh, good results. Um, the other architectures like the revalued HRR as well as the complex architecture have also good results with only one or two yellow arrows. So the same goes for um, this experiment as uh, uh, compared with the language recognition, um, the uh, synthetic results are mainly transferable to the real world applications. So yeah, that's the outcome of uh, our practical experiments. Okay, um, the last point is uh, regarding our MATLAB toolbox or, or our implementation. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we provide our source code and that can also be used as a MATLAB uh, toolbox. Um, to explain it um, very shortly, for example, you, have, you can initialize a different VSA environment with uh, a, specific, a specific type. Um, the types are all VSAs we evaluated and compared in our work and you can um, add some vectors uh, to the item memory. You can apply bundling, binding, and unbinding with this environment, and can also compute similarities between vectors, and can use the cleanup memory, or you find the k-nearest neighbors out of the item memory. And yeah, as you can see, it's very simple to use uh, this MATLAB toolbox. And yeah, it has to be noted that uh, this implementation is not as fast as possible, but yeah, it provides rapidly and easily testing of yeah, the different VSA types. And yeah, such a simple toolbox can be also beneficial for um, rapid prototyping of an application with a VSA. Okay, um, at the end, I would like to summarize the important insights of our comparison. Um, yeah, the first was that certain binding operations can have important ramifications for some applications. Uh, remember the taxonomy of our uh, one of the first slides. The second is that some VSAs show unexpected and significant results. Remember to the bundle capacity experiment. And yeah, our synthetic results are mainly transferable to real world applications. And yeah, some VSA vary a lot and some are better suited for specific tasks. And yeah, this has to be taken into account for selecting the best VSA. And finally, yeah, our MATLAB toolbox. And here we hope that this systematization has created a better access to this topic and that the best possible VSA can be selected for an appropriate application. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention and information as well as the code can be found on our web page. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Kenny, uh, for the great talk. So our applause go to you. Um, all right, we, we have some minutes for questions, reflections, comments. Anybody? I have a question. Go on. Uh, uh, Kenny, could you please go to slide 15? Yeah. Yeah. Slide. 
Yeah, so here, the, the last two VSA frameworks, what, what is their difference? Um, the difference between uh, the, the both experiments? Yeah, the, 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 last, the last two binary sparse distributed codes. SEG. One uh, is with okay. SEG. Yeah, the, the difference the between the one uh, this architecture is the, the binding operation. So the, the last uh, sparse binary VSA uses is a simple shifting of uh, director for binding. And uh, the first sparse binary used these uh, segment wise operations. So the complete rector is uh, divided into uh, is, is shift by defined number based on the other rector um, of the bundled uh, yeah, pair. I think thanks. I, I have a question. Go on, please. Um, have you? Con I, I think it will be interesting to measure this uh, capacity, but also considering the the memory space of the BCAs, because the binary vectors will use uh, maybe one bit or, or maybe eight bit. For each for each component, but the real vectors are, are going to take like 32 bits or, or even 64 bits of information. So it is a bit unfair the comparison, but, but it makes sense the results. Yeah. Um, but I think the memory capacity should also be considered. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. That's also an important point in memory capacity because yeah. As you mentioned, the binary rectors uh, needs only a few bits or only one bit for, per dimension. And yeah, the real rectors uh, need some more. Um, that's why I, I give the hint of that, that we only consider to the number of uh, dimensions and not the storage capacity. And yeah, it's, it's also important uh, to consider the memory capacity, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I, I think here, um, just to be clear on the terminology, um, I think here we, we mean the memory footprint of the reactor. So the, there is a comment by Chris, uh, and Chris Simkin in chat, uh, so, uh, which, is, uh, which is rather valid. So a 100 dimensional, uh, 100 dimensional 64 bit real reactor is equivalent to 6,400 6, bits binary reactor. So the, yeah. talking about dimensionality, so you should take into account the dimensionality of each position. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, also related to to this uh, previous question for uh, of the storage capacity, right? So the difference of uh, number of dimension and the required bits to to um, get to represent uh, the hypervector, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 This is uh, also important. That uh, maybe for the future to to extend the um, experiment of the bundle capacity with uh, considering to to the um, storage capacity, maybe by normalization of the uh, results by the um, yeah storage capacity or each uh, vector space. But yeah, it's it's uh, not. Uh, it was not part of our uh, comparison for um, at this point. Sure. Any more comments, questions? Uh, I would like to say something, yes. and that is uh, you. T you talked about permutations in as a part of the example and language recognition, but yeah. you really didn't didn't. You didn't compare permutations in your in your various things. That's something that you could you could do in the future. Extend your table. I mean, you have been using yeah. what the addition and multiplication too. But then, then how do these various kinds of um, architectures respond in terms of permutation? Because I think permutations really are they are powerful powerful thing to add yeah. into this. This is something this is something that Ross Gaylor really brought home to me and. And ever since I've been a real fan of permutations. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's true. Um, we assume the permutation um, as a circle shifting of the of the vectors, but uh, yeah, so we assume assume it for all all these A's as a circle shift. But yeah, the, the number of permutations and 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 the algebra of permutations is in, incredibly rich. Yeah, and we, we really haven't explored that hardly at all. Yeah. Yeah, it can also be a topic for your future work. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks too. Okay. Um, I guess if if there are any other questions or comments, please um, send them, uh, co uh, communicate them via um, our VSA community mailing list. So you can find the uh, uh, mail address in the invitation uh, email. Uh, also, Ross is uh, uh, writing his comments, so just not to forget about uh, his comment. Uh, I think Tony Plate showed that real representations only need very low resolution. So it might be better to think of reals as only four or eight bits each. Yeah, well, it's okay. also valid. Um, right, uh, but uh, once again, thank you uh, for attending this first session of uh, uh, winter session. Uh, of our webinars. So thank you to uh, thank uh, um, great thanks go to our two presenters, Peter and Kenny. Um, and uh, we see each other in two weeks from now. And uh, I can uh, give you some heads on uh, uh, that um, uh, the webinar will be uh, scheduled three hours earlier. So, uh, and it will happen at 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So, um, on 30th of November. So, but uh, I will come back uh, about this issue uh, in my next email. All right. Thank you very much for attending. Great to see you all. Bye. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye.